All right. And I see people coming and um, currently one by one by one. And uh, I think we, we got enough audience today. Uh, we can get started. All right. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and welcome to today's webinar on enhancing data security and resilience with Catalogic DPX. My name is Dali. If you see me before, I lead marketing in Catalogic, and uh, I'm thrilled to be your host for today's session. Uh, at Catalogic, we committed to providing cutting edge solutions to safeguard and manage your data across various platforms. So today we are excited to explore our flagship product Catalogic DPX to our, especially for our Asia and Pacific friends, enhance data security and resilience, particularly in the face of challenges like ransomware attacks. You know, a lot of people care about ransomware, whatever safeguard or, or attack. And uh, sometimes your server get down so we are focused on that today. So joining us today are two distinguished experts from Catalogia. We have Mr. Irving Kurapati, our head of channel <clears throat> and uh, alliance for the Asia Pacific region. And uh, Mr. Pavel Stianek, our CTO. So um, maybe start from you, uh, Irving. Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining. We are excited to present our technologies today to you. Hi, uh, good morning. <laughs> that's that's all I can say. It's it's about 7 a.m. and and where I am. So uh, hopefully Hope you had your uh, coffee, Powell. <laughs> yeah, Arvin, please keep me awake. <laughs> Cheers. We'll try. All right. Uh, here's today's uh, agenda. Some of you may be new to Catalogic software and uh, we will quickly introduce the company and the products uh, for today's topic on combating ransomware and the server downtimes that you are most interested about. We will set the stage uh, with a typical backup architecture. Then we will introduce various ransomware infection scenarios to understand how Catalogic software powerful capabilities help make a resilient and the security architecture. So uh, while, while we are presenting, you can uh, type your questions in Q&A uh, module anytime, and uh, I will remind our uh, speakers to answer the question. And of course, you can leave your uh, questions at the last part of the Q&A session. And uh, before the Q&A session, we will have a, a poll and we will have asked a very simple questions, like two questions and uh, to seek your advice of our product and of our future webinars. All right, uh, I will over to you, Arvin. Thank you very much, Doug. Good, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. And Doug and Powell, thank you for dialing very early in the morning from Poland. So like Da said, some of you may be new to Catalogic software. So we'll take a minute or two here just to quickly introduce who we are and what we do. Uh, Catalogic software itself has been in business in the data protection space for a very long time. In fact, we are probably one of the oldest players in this space. And uh, what we do is uh, with our three main solutions, DPX, V Plus, and Cloud Casa, we're able to provide smart, secure, and affordable data protection for literally any operating system, any hypervisor, any application database, Kubernetes environments. Okay? And these technologies could be in the data center, it could be in the cloud, or it could be in the edge. So what? So the next, what I'm about to show you here is a sample of some of the technologies that we help to back up and recover. Um, as you can see, like. AIX and Unix and Solaris is something that uh, we are able to do because of our very long history in the space. Uh, mission critical databases like Oracle and SAP HANA, the DB2, or even the modern databases like a MongoDB or a MySQL. Hypervisors, as I said, we support over 20 different virtualization platforms. And this is just a subset of what we support. You know, there's a long list of things that is not on the slide. Uh, doesn't mean it's not important. It's just for 
you know, just to give you a flavor of what we do. Um, and on the container space as well, whether it is AKS, EKS, GKE, SUSE Rancher, OpenShift, Mirantis, you name it, we, we support that. Yeah? And OpenStack as well. Yeah? So many of these technologies are getting a revival as people look at say, things like alternatives for VMware. So if you're, if you're looking for changes in your infrastructure, now may be a good time to look at Catalogic. Yeah? So what I'll do is here, just quickly give you uh, a very typical backup infrastructure that uh, many of our customers deploy. Yeah, And then we'll start talking about the various uh, capabilities within our backup architecture that will allow you to uh, enhance the data security and resilience of this architecture. Yeah? So on the left hand here is your production data. Yeah? It could be a combination of physical servers, virtual servers, running any of the different operating systems that uh, uh, that we, we talk, uh, that we talked about. It could be a bunch of NAS storage. Yeah, and uh, DPX here represents a master server application server that's helping you to manage the entire back backup process as well as the recovery process. And we do typically incremental for our backups that makes it very efficient and quick. Out here in the center, we we are representing where you're going to store the data okay? or some sort of backup appliance. In this case, we are representing a technology called vStore, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And uh, we have out, out here on the right, uh, what we are calling it the archive. Some people call it the secondary backup. And that could be tape, that could be on the cloud, or it could be another backup appliance uh, or in this case, again, we are representing a vStore, okay? So that's the typical example, okay? And this, this means that you have three copies of the data, your production, backup, and archive, and that is best practice, you know, from a three to one ransomware protection rule, okay? Now, tapes are immutable by nature. On, on your cloud storage or any sort of S3 compliant storage, we can leverage the object lock to make it immutable. Yeah? So that's kind of you know, where you can, you can start off from designing this kind of backup architecture. Yeah? So we said that the, the backup appliance that we represented in the middle is vStore. It's our software defined technology to create a backup appliance Powell, I know this is something that is very dear to you. Do you want to help the audience understand what vStore is all about? Sure, sure, not a problem. Uh, so vStore is a flexible and and, and highly scalable uh, software, uh, and and it's uh, it's it's a software defined storage solution, right? So so um, it allows users to manage and protect their data efficiently. So it, it's a, a little bit like a network attached storage, uh, but just meant um, if and focus solely on, on backups and security. So it supports features like, um, you know, snapshotting, cloning uh, your data and, and so on. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little, um, in a little while. Um, we'll talk about the, the deletion immutability and, and uh, guard mode integration. So that is all built in to ensure that your data is secure and it is it is easy to restore, right? So um, yeah, I'm, before I'll, I'll dive too deep, um, Arvind, is that, is that enough? Do we wanna cover more? Yeah, I think that probably helps to understand what vStore is all mm -hmm. about. And uh... Is there any requirement, Powell, on using a specific brand of server or storage to be able to make take advantage of vStore? That's that's a good question. So let me take a step back because there's one important thing that we might want to you know uh, emphasize here and highlight. vStore can be deployed both as a physical appliance or as a virtual appliance, right? So you can put it on your VMware. Um, and attached physical disks to it and whatever storage you have in your network. Um, but also you can roll it out as a physical appliance and deploy it on top of the Linux operating system. Um, 
do we have anything any particular brand well actually vstar is hardware agnostic right so um that means you can deploy vstar on a wide variety of of servers storage servers um and you know uh, jbots right just just a bunch of disks so this gives you the flexibility avoiding the vendor lock-in um and you can repurpose or just use your existing infrastructure uh to make sure that you're uh utilizing what you already have in the best and and choose the hardware that best that best suits your uh performance and and cost requirements awesome awesome and when you say highly scalable, Pavel, what kind of scalability are we talking about? Uh, terabyte yeah, so, scale, petabyte scale? Yeah, that's that's actually petabyte scale scalability, right? So so with the built-in technologies, um, mainly around um, uh, ZFS file system, Vistor is designed to grow with your data needs. Uh, so whether you're managing just a couple of terabytes at the very beginning, and then you're thinking that your data might grow to to over over a petabyte. You don't have to worry. We are scaling to a petabyte scale without compromising uh, on on performance. Okay, awesome. That's petabyte with a P, yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah. P for power, P for petabyte. I would say. Okay. All right. Cool. So, so what we just talked about is this technology that's completely hardware agnostic, and that gives you the ability to build a very scalable backup infrastructure at a very, very effective, cost-effective manner. And we also said that immutability comes from our software, not the underlying server or storage. Yeah? So when we look back at the reference architecture that we started off with, what that means is that you have immutability in your backup destination as well as the archive destination, correct? That's that's fair to say, it, correct, Powell? Yes, that is correct, sir. That okay. was a awesome. Okay, so anyway, today's topic is so that's minimum, right? Immutability is the minimum that people expect when you talk about ransomware protection. Yeah. So let's talk about what else we can help with for our customers in terms of resiliency and data security. Okay. In addition to immutability, there's a concept called locks, okay? And, uh, and maybe just kind of help the audience understand locks versus immutability, Pavel. Um, sure, sure. And that's, that's actually a, that's a, that's a broad topic. And I, I remember writing a, you know, a, a blog article about that because there is, there's a lot of, you know, there's, there are a lot of different terms used to describe things that are very similar but not exactly the same. Right. So I would I would start with um you've you've got the concept of write once um and read many, right? So what uh, the acronym WARM starts uh, for. So that's 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 where like this represents a tape world, right? You just put it right once on the tape, or it could could be it could be that like that, right? You put it once on the tape, then you know, you put it out and it, it becomes, you know, right once um, and read many times. Now, um, then there is a concept of uh, of uh, locking the data, right? Because even despite you write it to a media, you put it out and then you can still put it in, you can override it, right? Or like, you know, even, even with uh, DVDs and so on, there was a time when it was, you know, just writable only once. Then there were there was technology to write multiple times, and so on, right? So, so um, you can put a lock on it, right? But then, if you have, if you combine both of these technologies, in in my in my mind, this is where the true immutability is being built, right? So it is not only the the techni technological limitation or logistical limitation; it's also the controls put around that and this is what we try to this is what we focused on building on um, vstores um immutability where we had the zfs underlying layer so the primary storage the file system allows you to take a snapshot of of the file system and its current state 
All right, so uh, you put some data on it, you put a snapshot, then you change the data, you do another snapshot, then you realize some of the data is wrong or you've made a modification. You want to go back, right? So you bring up uh, that snapshot. You cannot modify it, which is pretty cool. We are halfway there now, but there is still a way that, you know, someone will log in and will just delete your data, will delete that snapshot now. So, so we've built... An abstraction layer, we build all the controls around that functionality to prevent anyone from control from deleting this in an uncontrollable manner. And by that, I mean you've got in in Vistor, you've got uh, at least you, you've got two types right now of of uh, controls um, here in, in in a ZFS layer or in in the data layer. So you can put either a flexible log or um, or a fixed log. So we'll talk the uh, we'll talk about that um, in a moment, but um, in depth when I'll be showing you how the Vistor UI looks like. But this is this is uh, mainly it, right? Th does it make sense, Arvind? I think I think so. So right, so you're essentially preventing any sort of accidental deletion of that immutable copy, right? Correct. Even from mm -hmm. us, right? Even we can't delete those snapshots once you enable that. Is my understanding, right? So. Totally. Again, again, just to kind of build out what this enhanced layers of resiliency and data security that we're talking about. So in addition to mutability, you can turn on the locking and, uh, and anyway, the access to this vStore is controlled through multi-factor authentication. So you have Correct. an additional layer of security like you mentioned earlier. Correct. And you have two types of locks, both for the backup and the archive, okay? So Powell, do we want to switch screens and maybe show the vStore console how it looks like and how we're going to turn on this locking capability? Sure, sure, absolutely. Uh, so let me just share my screen. Uh, but before I'll do that, you will have to stop sharing. Okay, let's do that. At least that's what Zoom tells okay. me. Okay, perfect. Done. Alrighty, so I think we are there yet. Can you guys see? Can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Oh, okay, perfect. So that's that's part of my uh, lab um, setup. So we have a vStores uh, GUI here, and let me just move those windows around so that I can see all the controls. Okay, perfect. So. Um, as you can see um, on the right top, you can see that I'm logged in with my individual account. And then there is um, then there is uh, an indicator that I'm using uh, multi-factor authentication. We can go through the process of setting up account from a scratch, but um, I'm, I'm trying to be mindful about the times, but there will be, uh, hopefully if, if a little bit of time is left then we'll, we'll go through all of that. Now, okay, so let's let's take a look at the dashboard. You can see some of the, the statistics right now. This is a tiny, uh, tiny setup with, with just like 100 gigs of space um, in, its, in its pools. So, you know, vStore allows you to group multiple physical drives into pools, then you split those they split the pool into into logical volumes. So in this particular case, we have a logical volume, uh, well called uh, volume one. Okay, so let's take a look at that. What's what's inside? So you see some of the general information in here. You see a couple of tabs that will uh, that allow you to efficiently manage the data and and some uh, and replication settings and so on. Share uh, specific portions of that data. So let's take a look at the snapshots. We, so as you can see, this is the volume used for uh, keeping a backup of um, some of uh, some of the uh, virtual machines. Uh, each backup has been done on a daily basis for about a week or so. Um, and any, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, you can see the size used. So that means what, what is the incremental of the data, um, on, on that snapshot versus previous snapshot, right? So, so this is what it is. Now let's go back to the details table. We've got a couple of important settings here. We've got the volume protection. So what does that mean? If I'll enable, uh, volume deletion log, it means that every time, uh, I will create a snapshot 
that snapshot will be automatically locked. So that means it will not be removable. Um, so no one will be able to to uh, remove that without um, additional confirmation or remove it in case of a fixed lock until um, a specific time um, a time amount passes. Now we've got also file level immutability, which is another layer of security, right? Because well, first at, at the bottom layer, you've got this snapshot functionality that creates an immutable um, you know, snapshot of the file system status on a in a given point in time. Then you've got the 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 locking mechanism that prevents blocks all the APIs, all the possible ways to delete that that data without going through additional verification or uh, verifying against the time defined. And then finally, we've got the third layer, which is the file immutability. That means that even um, if someone gets access to to a file system. He will not be able to change a file, remove the file, manipulate it. It's it's controlled by the file system, um, by the file system itself, right? So, so and and the third one is auto snapshot. Uh, but we can get to that um, hopefully a little bit later. This is a pretty in intuitive option, right? So it allows the system to actually decide, uh, depending on 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 some settings, um, and and your decisions when to take a snapshot of your data. Um, some, you know, like DPX backup software, every time it, it pushes some data to vStore, it takes a snapshot, right? So, so your data, so we have that point in time uh, granularity to go back and see the data from, from previous versions and whatnot. But if if you just want to put some of your own data and use it as a NAS share or whatever, um, then you can have that functionality enabled and the, the system will decide, you know, to take a snapshot um when a certain amount of data has changed or a certain amount of data uh, time has passed so then it uh, it will just you know do that point in time snapshot now um let's uh, let's take a look at you know one of those uh snapshots and let's uh let's take a look at more actions you have the option to enable protection so let's click that so we, we now we have a pop up and there is there, there, that's the time when you when you can decide whether you want a flexible protection so um this means that you can either you know keep it until forever um and um and 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 just remove it um when when it's needed to be able to remove it it's you will need to provide a one time uh one time password so um so that you know the one uh, the mechanism used for multi factor authentication and um the other option is a fixed protection fixed protection uh does not give you an option to change this in whatever way until it is specified so if you set a time span of of you know one day one month one year or whatever like you know 3 years 4 years um you you will not be able to delete that data. We will not be able to delete that data, um, and and only until the time has has passed that data can be then managed and manipulated. Right. So it's great for uh, regulatory requirements and and whatnot. While if you want to implement um, uh, something a little bit more flexible then you can use the flexible protection where you can define uh, um, uh, you know the retention or not right so um once you enable this you will see an icon on a snapshot and um, and the date until when that that uh, protection is is enabled now um Aravind, if we have do we do we have at least one more minute or Go for it, Paolo. I'm... okay Go for it, Paolo. thanks so much Okay, so um, that deletion protection, all that 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 lock-in mechanism, not only works on a snapshot level, right? And and let's remember about that. If I would enable the functionality, you know, on on the volume level, that means that every snapshot automatically is going to be created as immutable. Now, you know, it, when it comes to backups, it's it's a little tricky, right? Because at some point. Um, the protection has to be aligned with your data protection rules and the data retention. So uh, that's that's the DPX part of the world. So uh, I'll leave it for now, but it's important to remember. And now the important thing, the, the, the interesting thing is that if you have, you can have multiple, um, I don't have a replication set up on this host, but 
um, if you have multiple V stores um, connected to uh, to each other, right? To replicate the data, because this is how you can um, how you can um, manage your data, right? So we have a concept of partnerships. Um, where you add another V store, I would need to type in the address. I don't think we have time for this, but I'm I'm going to make sure to set up another V store focused, like exclusively V store focused um, webinar with our event, and uh, so to 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 show you all that. But you can set up a partnership, then the then your data can become replicated on a time based um, schedule or or um, whatnot. Like let's uh, not dive there. So. Um, awesome. Just real quick, once the data is, you know, on the replication level, um, you can also define that uh, protection, right? So on on uh, that means that your primary visa, like the first visa that you write to, and it has to be a little bit more flexible, right? So because there are applications that modify the data, and that would be just too big of a, com it would be too cumbersome to actually, you know, manipulate that uh, blockings and, and so on then you can actually enable that protection on a replication. So that means your data from one vStore gets moved to another vStore and it automatically becomes immutable on the second vStore. So if you put it in the cloud on a remote location or just you know side by side, um, it, it, it allows you to have one copy of your data, just completely fle flexible, living, moving, and within changing. And the other, once it is replicated, it becomes immutable, locked, and protected from both tampering, modifications, and deletion as well. Okay. Awesome. Thank, uh, thank you, Paolo. So all right. now let's talk about while we are switching switching screens, while you stop sharing and I start again, mm -hmm. let's talk about the licensing model. Okay. This must be very expensive, right? Restore. That is the good part, and I could talk about that for uh, for a little while as well, but I'll try to be brief. Um, we know all the other products um, in a data production world, and we and th these are you know don't get me wrong, these are good products. But as the the product grows, it add it keeps adding features, right? So and you spend time on this, and you you keep investing into that, and then um, you know you you offer a solution. And this solution can uh, become a little, you know, it, it just becomes very broad, very flexible. It has multiple components. It has, you know, all kinds of uh, mechanism and integrations with infrastructure, virtual, physical, and whatnot, right? And then you end up, you buy a product, and then you end up in a situation that actually, you know, the license is is not only like cap capacity-based or or it's socket-based, but it's also also feature-based. So then you you buy something and you end up learning that, well, okay, so I do have to uh, pay separately for, I don't know, like, you know, my favorite hypervisor uh, backup or some advanced features or ransomware, it's already partially there, but to actually use complete detection and so on, I have to buy a module or the storage that I have um, in my license is actually just the basic layer and a mutability locking snapshots and security uh, is actually offered by a third-party vendor. Not the case with Catalogic. Yeah. Okay, we've built everything. We've got we've got this something that I I called um and and uh, a battery included approach. It's not like you buy you know something and then you have to go back because you forget to get the batteries. No, the batteries are included. So with your license, you get the uh, DPX license, you get the data protection license, you get the storage license, you get the ransomware detection um license as well everything included yeah wonderful so basically v store is free for all our yeah. customers right uh and there's tremendous value in terms of delivering compute and storage agnostic um immutability and locking yeah now let's talk about you know we probably need to speed up here a bit we're already half past here let's talk about some different ransomware scenarios yeah so when in a ransomware scenario, it's well known that backup targets are one of the prime targets for ransomware. Because okay? if both the production and the backup copies are taken hold of, then that's much higher leverage in that scenario. Okay? 
So ransomware could infect specific servers, virtual machines could affect specific files. It could also affect your backup repository or the catalog server. Yeah? The master server, we call it the catalog server yeah? or the application server. So these are very typical targets as we know. Yeah? Now, one of the things that we have further done for this restore is what we call guard mode. That is end-to-end -end proactive ransomware detection. Yeah. So um, what that means is that you, for the servers and the applications that you're protecting, there's proactive ransomware detection going on there. Once you have the copies over at both the backup and the archive, you are able to do on-demand uh, scans for de to detect ransomware, okay, both here at the backup and the archive. And what we'll, what we'll share in the next few minutes is why is that important, right? Because you, you, I'm sure you have a cybersecurity strategy, you have tons of different technologies deployed to detect ransomware. Why do you need this yeah? in the context of backup? Yeah? And uh, before we maybe show a demo of that, uh, Powell maybe take two minutes to highlight some of the things that we do to ensure there's a high degree of accuracy in our detection mechanism? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, okay. Now, uh, just lost connection to the to lab, but I'll try to resume it in the background. Um, so, yeah, so, well, um, I, I would I would want to emphasize one thing. When, when we build a guard mode, the, the, you know, the idea was to to protect, to offer a proactive, proactive approach, right? Because we've been in a data protection world for 25 plus years, as you said, and, and we know the data inside out, right? We've, we've been there when the migration from, you know, mainframe was, you know, full speed ahead and, and uh, you know, and uh, the adoption of the so-called, you know, person, PC architecture and whatnot was, you know, was, was all, um, full speed ahead and and um and we've we see we we seen all those databases growing and and whatnot and you know people switching over from file shares to s3 and and all of that so we thought that you know we've been there we saw we saw a lot of things we 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 have uh we are protecting the data but then with ransomware that was a slightly different type of a risk right because you could be backing up your data your data and your files just you know on on your windows or linux box or whatever they they look okay right until you want to use them and then you learn um that they are actually um encrypted or not and not usable and um though of course until uh, unless you you have not found the ransom um ransom node somewhere lying on your on your system right but then uh we thought okay but that might you know a typical detection is just you know it, it keeps changing right but but at some point it was weeks before people would notice that the encryption is ongoing and the threat actors will wait and try to encrypt and do as much damage as possible uh before getting in touch to to ask for uh for you know for a payment now so so we thought how do we guarantee how do we make our users uh, you know, calm in a sense, like, you know, to, to make sure that their backups are running fine, but it's not only that, but it, that what they are backing up is actually what they need to back up. Is, is that actually your data that you're, that you're, um, doing, right? So, so this is how guard mode was built. And, and initially it was meant to be upfront, right? You know, like in, in the very beginning of the process. So, uh, close to your data, deployed on on the on the agents, deployed alongside the agents, deployed on the host that you're protecting, and then you could do a couple of things, right? You've got the block list that you um, that you define a known ransomware patterns, file names, extensions, and whatnot. If any of those files will be spotted, um, and the detection and the monitoring is happening live, right? We are plugged into a kernel uh, with our module and monitoring and do the, the live detection. So if any of those files will, will pop up, you immediately get a notification, right? But what happens if they have not deployed those files 
and they are still traversing the network shares and our file systems, we've got honeypots functionality, right? So you can plant in multiple locations, you plant files that have a known um, checksums and, and no known structure. So if anything, um, whether it's user or or a ransomware, we'll, but we'll try to tamper with, we'll try to modify them, rename them, move them, delete them, and so on, you'll get a notification, right? So internally, you should instruct your users what, what these are, but but then again, um, if you put an um, unassuming name, should be safe there and, and um, give you additional layer of protection. Then you get the flexibility, but let's go first to the pattern matching, right? So... Then you have the, the mechanism that is combined to a threshold and the amount of actions of specific type happening in the back end of the system, right? So the the we see if we'll notice that there is a huge increase in renames or deletions or general file operations or data moving from one location to the other or 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 um, changing in extensions, we'll start additional analysis, we'll create an alert. Then of course, on every system there's a location that is totally normal it's it's totally okay for it to change oftenly because that's how the applications are working how or how users are working you can exclude specific location you can create that green lanes where you know in a specific location that data can change right and and that's 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 not only that is because there's an additional advanced layer that after we detect some kind of you know sequences of activities that look suspicious, whether that's block list honeypot or pattern matching with that with the threshold detection, there is additional um, mechanism checking that kicks in and it checks whether uh, the file was encrypted, right? And we detect that in multiple ways. We are looking at the metadata. We are taking a look at the data randomness and look with, if the Excel file looks as an Excel file on a binary level, right? So then if we'll yeah. if we'll know that you know a block list kicked in or or something or a honeypot uh was was manipulated, and then you start seeing a data that is, you know, has a metadata of an Excel file or extension of an Excel file, but in 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 inside, inside it's it's encrypted, compressed, and unreadable, we'll we'll know, you know, you get the certainty that something is definitely not right. Got it. Wow, thank you so much for that detailed explanation. So if I may just go back to that previous slide in here. So what we are saying here is that, you know, in addition to the immutability and the locking that gives you a high guarantee of the immutability, we also have the ability to detect traces of ransomware early, at both at the endpoint, as well as if you need to do an on-demand scan at the vStore level to make sure that the snapshots of recovery points are clean, we have the ability to do so. And while we are doing that, we have the ability to create events. And that's typically a syslog event that you would uh, point it to your SIEM solution. Uh, that way your standard incident response and your SOC team can pick up these things as early as possible, yeah? So just in the interest of time, uh, Powell, so probably what I'll do is I'll quickly touch upon this as well and the next couple of slides, and then maybe we can switch for a demo again. Yeah. So uh, so in a, in a ransomware situation, what's really important is also when when do you have that clean copy? Yeah. And uh, how can you, how, how do you know which clean copy to go back to? And how do you recover a clean copy as well? Yeah. So now we have all these time step events that tell you when these encryption uh, activities started, right? So that's on the live, so you can use that. Okay? You can also do an on-demand scan of the recovery point here uh, in your in your vStore, okay? And then you know which point in time or recovery point is clean. Okay? And that way you actually don't need to do a full restore and scan it. We call it a recovery without restore, without restore, without the need to restore. So that becomes a very efficient and simple process, you know, without having to stand up another set of infrastructure for a sandbox environment, scan there, et cetera, et cetera. Instead, you can just scan using our guard mode to a recovery point and then use that to recover. Yeah. You know? And I'm assuming the same process. Uh, uh, Powell, if let's say 
there's a scenario where some critical files on the endpoints yeah are are corrupted okay whether it is ransomware or any other means if you need to quickly recover what you need is the ability to browse a recovery point point which is a point in time copy and then browse to a specific file and being able to quickly recover yeah so i would imagine the process is the same for both yeah um and again we have the ability to explore browse and recover specific files which which just makes the whole process very simple and efficient okay uh do we want to jump to a demo again paul and then while you're on that maybe sure. we touch upon the the snapshot explorer as well yeah. sure absolutely stop, share. Uh... stop share okay things just to a time check i think we have about 18 minutes left okay i i i get that i mean i you know message received uh all right um okay so yeah so that's that's the screen we've seen before so get we got volume one um let's take a look at that let's let's take a look to, again at these at the list of snapshots now what is what is important here um you've got a couple of options here um and the one that is interesting is mount what is that going to do so when you click mount then actually the you know the functionality that we started calling snapshot explorer and actually that sticked so you know we went to the market with this um is going to scan the volume right because it can contain all all kinds of different data right it and it and it will like in in reality it it does uh on that part on that particular snapshot we do have um we we have vstore detected it it did not have to connect to the backup system it did not have to you know read any kind of you know catalog of metadata and whatnot it just scanned the file system uh scanned that volume and so that there are three mountable file systems on this particular uh particular volume right so and it it it's tried to uh include like we we made it aware of the dpx format so it will be able to, or it is able to extract the information from uh, from a, from a backup files uh, sitting on vStore, but being you know completely in the backup. Um, what what that exact actually is? So we we have the VM name, we have the hard disk name and the hard disk uh, file name, and and actually we were able to also extract even the you know the job name that that did a backup. Right, so uh, based on this, uh, you can actually choose if 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 your you know if your enterprise data protection solution is not available, like you know the server is down, or um, or you want an isolated restore, you name it, um, you can select this the file system and just mount them. Right, so uh, it takes about a minute or two. So I I did that in in the meantime. So let's just go back to the to the storage up and you can see this shows up as a separate volume now you know the, the way it works uh and why it takes you know a couple minutes to do that is that th those files first of all they are you know cloned which is um which is a relatively quick operation but then there is a tiny tiny virtual machine spun up to actually make sure that your data is isolated is protected is completely you know secure to get access to and also gives us the possibility to, to inject the specific um, drivers, modules, and whatnot to actually make the file system readable. So let's take a look at that um, in in, um, in in this screen. You can see the browser. So I, I mounted uh, the minimal uh, Windows 2016. I think that was the that was the 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 one I chosen. So it detected that there are two partitions here. Um, and as you can see, it's it's totally browsable. You can go here and just you know take a look at that, see what are the users, and you know, uh, and all all the files. I don't think any anything's going to be there on the on the desktop. But you know, you it, that's a that's a actually you know NTFS file system. You can browse, you can select the files that you want to click and download, um, and that's gonna you know that is going to be prepared for you zipped up and and then you can uh, restore it for example now there is the other thing 
right? So that's the guard mode scan. So on top of the the the, the stuff, uh, but I'm jumping probably a little bit ahead, right? Or or I'm mixing uh your 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 uh, plan, Arvin, right? Uh, but can I can I just continue with the guard mode scan? After the the you know the Starship Explorer, there's anything you want to cover ahead. in the meantime? Go ahead, Pablo. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Pablo. All right. Cool. So, uh, you mounted the file system. You have it. You know, available. You can browse. You can download the files uh, without your data protection solution. So this is the beauty of this, right? And you have the 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 granular controls of the users having access to specific files and whatnot, right? I'm I'm going quick about this. And now you've got the guard mode scan. So. I, I told you a little bit about the guard mode being on, in, in, in front of those th the things, right? Monitoring, actively monitoring the files that are being modified, manipulated, and whatnot. Now, we, you know, we we looked at this, and after some time, we say, like, why don't we just put it also on the back? So it's not only there on the front, but there are also probably some systems that you cannot you know, money, you cannot get the, your uh, guard mode installed on, on them because of some restrictions. You don't have access to console or whatever. Um, then, or like, well, never mind. What the, and then, then you just uh, want to scan your backups, right? You just want to make sure that whatever you, you did um, in, in terms of backups is also secure. So we've added, we started in integration with, with guard mode on the backend layer. So when, when the the data is moved into the file system, then you to to Vistor's file system, you can actually mount it and scan this, right? So, so now what what is actually happening? The guard mode is pre-configured to detect ransomware patterns, uh, traces of encryption, and anything suspicious on in, in the data, any kind of data anomalies. Um, as you can see right now, you know, on the mounted file system, I initiated guard mode scan and it's going to go in a process. It's it, depending on the file system, depending on your storage, depending on, on a couple of factors, you will see, uh, it, it might take some time, right? As you can see here, it already detected some files that our test environment has planted. Um, there is LSAS extension is known for, uh, to, to be used by specific strain of ransomware for ransom nodes, right? So as you can see, if that would be a backup, you already know like, okay, this is compromised. Um, I got to take a look at this file system and I definitely don't want this file, the, this snapshot or this volume, this backup to be used for a restore, right? So, um, that's, that's it. So. It, I, I would love to talk, talk about a little bit about the future, but hopefully we'll um, uh, we'll have time for this in the, in the next couple of minutes. But we this is this is what we started with. Um, there are a couple of more more items to it, but then in future it's going to grow, and and there's going to be a lot more flexibility, possibility of scheduling those scans automatically, letting Vistor to decide what needs to be scanned, to put all that history in place in the context and whatever. And there's so much more that we are getting ready to deploy um, in the next versions. Back to you, Arvind. Uh, sorry Thank you, to Paul. interrupt a little bit. Uh, I see a question in, in Q&A, mm -hmm. I believe, which related to uh, guard mode integrated with the VStore, which is, is there any slowness during backups because of pre and post scans? Uh, well, That's actually, Actually, it all depends on the scale, right? But uh, but in in a typical operation, uh, there is not a lot of overhead. This is not we we uh, we folk when we um, implemented this, we focused um, on making sure that this is in no way impacting the the backup and and restore operations, right? And what is also important to emphasize this is all happening internally there's no like external agent that is getting involved or it, the file system is getting mounted somewhere so it needs to be transferred no it's all happening internally uh, and 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 locally to to the vstore so uh and and the way that the file system vstore's file system is managing uh, clones and snapshot is making you know the minimal overhead on the file system actually there's no uh, impact I could you know go and and run a backup or or uh, create another snapshot and whatnot without any any issues. Now, um, of course, scanning the file system um, and indexing all those files and going through them and then taking a peek into into the the ones that looks look suspicious will have a little bit of an overhead. We'll have you know a couple of percent of the CPU uh, impact, but. 
Um, I want to reassure you that uh, there is a proper isolation of, of priorities there. And the the backup and restore functionality on vStore is is the primary um, is the primary focus and and um, for in terms of stability, so so this is um, this is completely safe, right? Of course, if you will attempt to scan like you know 150 uh, things at the same time, that could become a problem. But there is uh, there are also configuration settings that help to manage this. I hope this helps. Thank you, Paul. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. Paul, I think you need to stop screen share for me to share. There you go. Thank you. By, by the way, I want to mention that so I opened the chat so everyone can leave your message in the chat box and uh, we will try to answer that at the Q&A session. All right, so hopefully you're able to see my screen again. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so so what Powell just showcased was the ability to be very granular about what files you can restore and the confidence that that restore is a clean restore because of the inbuilt uh, ransomware scans that you can do before you do the recovery, yeah? which is very powerful, right? because uh, you don't know what you don't know. You might have ended up copying a corrupted or an infected version on one of the snapshots. What you don't want is to bring back that corrupted version on the production. Uh, and so that, that's one of the hardest tasks in that scenario. And like, when, what is that point in time where you can go and uh, find that clean set of data, okay? All right, um, and uh, there's, one other scenario, which is very unique to how we uh, have designed this architecture, um, and that's my personal favorite. Yeah? And I think in the last webinar that uh, where we covered some of this, uh, I I think uh, Da, you you refer to this kind of attacker as a as a James Bond uh, or some sort of superhero uh, attacker, right? So what if your master server or the catalog server is down, okay? What do you do in that case, okay? You're not, you know, most of the architectures are designed in such a way that you need this master server to know where the snapshots are, what are the recovery points, being able to browse files, et cetera, et cetera. What we do uniquely in this, in this vStore is something called vStore Snapshot Explorer. What that allows you to do is even if the master server of DPX is down, you can independently access, and we already said this is, has uh, multi-factor authentication. Uh, you can independently access the web console of this repository, browse all the recovery points, and then use any of the recovery points to restore to a production server, okay? So that is, very, very unique, okay? Which means, let's say you, and it's a number of scenarios, right? Let's say the master server is down, you still have the ability to recover from the backup appliance. Let's say you have a highly distributed environment with lots of edge locations and a data center. They're able to independently do things by putting a vStore at the edge, yeah? So there are a number of different use cases where you can, uh, you have the flexibility and the added resiliency in data security because of this uh, vStore v, v, v snapshot explorer. Okay? And that is something that uh, it's, again, the, the key thing is independent data access without any dependency on the catalog server or the master server being available. Okay? This I think is one of the unique things that we do. Yeah? So what it means is that, uh, you know, this kind of, to bring it all together, right? What we discussed today is our flagship product DPX powered by vStore as the backup repository, both for the backup copy, as well as the archive slash secondary copy. And that is a very cost-effective way to build your backup appliance that comes with Im immutability, locking, multi-factor authentication, ransomware scans, 
and independent access of that backup appliance, even when the master server is down, as well as guard mode, which is available at the endpoints, as well as at integrated into vStore. Okay? So all of these three components are working very harmoniously. And when you, if we go back to the, 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 the architecture that we started, we said the immutability comes from tape, immutability comes from object lock if you use an S3 object storage. But beyond that, using our vStore and DPX, yeah, you can you can enable locking, you can enable immutability. Okay? You get ransomware detection at the endpoint as well as all the vStore copies, as well as independent access for recovery uh, with our vStore snapshot explorer. Okay? So I think that's, that makes it a very, very comprehensive architecture to achieve the, this data resiliency and security. Yeah. And uh, in addition to the technology aspects that we cover, we do have thousands of customers across the world who are trusting us for many, many years. And that's backed not by the technology, but our fantastic customer support team who consistently get very high net promoter scores and the licensing models that uh, we're happy to discuss offline. And the support is, itself is 24 bar seven. And the technologies that we said are very scalable. For example, the vStore we said is petabyte, uh, petabyte scale. And of course, we've been around the block for a very long time. So we support both the legacy technologies like Unix, tape, and the modern technologies like cloud and Kubernetes. Yeah? So that, I think, hopefully gave a flavor for what Catalogic is all about. Yeah? And uh, we'll leave the QR code over here for you to scan if you need to find out how to contact us or request a demo or a trial. So we'll leave that in there for a minute while we probably look through the questions and cover them as many as possible in the next five minutes. So Irvin, uh, before before our Q and A session, I, I I see a lot of questions in Q and A, even in the chat box. Before we have that, uh, uh, I do really have a request to ask everyone to join the pool. We have two questions. One is about which is the uh, your favorite feature in DPX we mentioned today and you think it's most relevant to your cybersecurity or backup requirement or environment. And uh, another question is about what would you look for what to the next webinar is about? So just uh, yep. just to join the show sure. and uh, we, we can, definitely, yeah. Absolutely. We will definitely have a follow-up webinar here in the coming weeks on how we can help you do agentless, crash-resistant, application-consistent backups for over 20 different virtualization platforms. So we'll definitely... That is the thing that we have planned in a couple of weeks. We'll let you know. But other than that, if there are deep dives that you want to know, please answer Das question. Yeah. Now let's look. Let's start looking at the Q and A and questions. I think we have five minutes here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We have a Q and A question about the for Gamma. Is there will be up, update ransomware signature for cover new patterns of ransomware attack? I believe the guy answered yes, and uh, maybe Irvin probably will maybe have for a Powell. more comprehensive one. Yeah, I think yeah, Paul. Uh, sorry, guys. I was I was focusing on answering that, and actually, I typed in the answer on uh -huh. on on the chat. So. But just to recap, yes, and and depending on the on the scenario where you have the guard mode deployed, and whether it's a standalone scenario or the one with uh, integrated with with DPX, we haven't. I would love. I mean, like I, as you can see, hopefully, I'm I'm really excited to share all those all those things because we've spent so much time, you know, countless hours developing all that stuff, and when I get a chance to actually, you know. Come out and and show this and talk to 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 people and and present what we've did. It's it, it makes makes me really excited. So um, 
but uh, to come back to to, to this, I, I would love to talk about different deployment scenarios of guard mode. But there is like we we collect the information about patterns, um, ransomware pattern, like ransom nodes, rename patterns, and all that kind of stuff from from different trusted sources. And then we combine, we test them first, and then um, and then we combine uh, them into the uh, into a list that is maintained on our servers and distributed to guard mode automatically. There is a uh, there's a portion of DPX that manages that part, and and it will download to a central location and distribute um, to all the guard mode agents deployed. Uh, but it, it, different types of updates are also, you know, including manual, semi-automated, or um, or a, a lo hosting of 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 the file in a in a specified location internally on in your infrastructure. Um, you know, there's a lot a lot of things are possible. So so this is this is how it's done. But th these things are being updated um, a couple of times. Uh, a couple of times, uh, a, 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 at least a couple of times a year. More often than that. Uh, uh, so, so it and then you can use those. So, so it's it's getting there. You know, we are getting updates, and we'll continue to get updates. Thank you, Paul. I think we are over time here. Uh, any unanswered questions will be sure to follow up. Uh, Stephen, I see there's a question there. We have your email address. We'll follow up on that for sure. Uh, and uh, I think we already touched upon the next webinar and we have some feedback on what topics to cover. With that said, okay. any concluding remarks, Dar, from you? Um, yeah, we still have two questions and uh, I think we will try to provide this uh, content and share to our attendees. One is about the license licensing model and uh, about details about licensing. Another is from uh, our chat box uh, about our competitive sure. stuff and the marketing. Okay. So we will provide yeah. that. Uh, sure. yeah. yeah content for, the to... for the licensing, we have options between capacity and number of servers, perpetual and subscription. So you can mix and match those. So happy to take that question in more detail offline and we'll be sure to follow up anyway. Once again, Powell, Da, Really appreciate you getting up very early in the morning at Poland. And everybody, thank you for dialing in. Thank you for attention and your time. And uh, hope to see you on the next webinar and uh, have for the conversations after this. Okay, thank you again. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.